Gen Z needs Bitcoin. Welcome back to the show. I'm Natalie Brunel, and I'm so excited to share my guest this week is Ella Huff. She's an incredible contributor to the Bitcoin space. She's uh, encouraging Generation Z to adopt Bitcoin, and she's also studying some really interesting things with regards to AI, language models, moral codes. So Ella, thank you so much for joining me. No, it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me, Natalie. Well, I know you're a junior at Cornell, um, but tell me a little bit about how you came to, to know about Bitcoin and feel so passionate that everyone in your generation should be educated about it. Yes, I'd be happy to. So I typically say I first discovered Bitcoin and I learned about Bitcoin, um, or maybe interchangeably, but I first heard the word Bitcoin when I was a senior in high school. Um, so this was 2021, and I was in a class called Blockchain. Um, and I was also taking the Gary Gensler blockchain and money course on YouTube, a um, couple after school things kind of on crypto. And so I only heard about Bitcoin and number go up, um, didn't resonate with me really whatsoever. Um, and then the following year, so my freshman year of college, I was working at IBM um, and I was also taking a class on creativity. And when I was in that creativity class, they said, okay, you need to choose a creator to study for the entirety of the semester. And so I chose Kathy Wood. Um, so kind of everywhere around me in classes, in work, um, I was hearing about technology. And I love the way Kathy puts it of kind of disruptive innovation and creative destruction as two sides of the same coin. And so I was hearing all this and I was like, okay, you know, technology is how I'm going to be on the right side of change, that I'm going to focus on asking questions and not just look at answers. Um, so I had these influences and then that summer, so a full year after I heard about Bitcoin for the first time, um, my mom and I went to the Oslo Freedom Forum. And I think that is when, for the first time, I really appreciated Bitcoin and really fell down the rabbit hole. Um, so it's been a journey of kind of number go up, totally went over my head. And then I found the freedom go up and, you know, Bitcoin as, as Sailor says, a digital energy savings technology and innovation. Um, and now I'm just so deep down the rabbit hole because of knowledge go up and all the depth to your life that you get from Bitcoin. Um, so that's kind of my journey of why I am so grateful to have found Bitcoin, but why does Gen Z need Bitcoin? Um, in short, I think looking at the whole person of, you know, maybe a 20 something year old, technically, I think the range is like 26 to 10. Um, but the 21 million Bitcoin are Gen Z's tools for the 21st century. Um, I heard a really great quote where it was basically, if you have life, you have purpose and go find it. And for me, I found my purpose through Bitcoin. Um, and I think for Gen Z, you know, they have life, they have purpose and Bitcoin, not just as a monetary asset, but is their tool to find purpose um, and live the life, whatever it is that they feel called to do, to just have the ability to do it. Um, so I think that's kind of on the whole person why Gen Z really needs Bitcoin. It's interesting that you bring up purpose because I feel like that's so important. Um, it's essential for the human spirit and for us to have hope and for us to want to work hard. And exactly. for sure, Gen Z, I think, gets attacked a little bit, especially yeah. these days, because they don't want to work the, the nine to five. Um, I think that a lot of them think the idea of having a house is out of reach. Same with my generation, millennials. Mm -hmm. and, and so I'm curious, why do, you, why do you think that is? Why do you think that um, the overall perception of Gen Z is that they don't want to work, they don't have a sense of purpose, they're just kind of spending all their time online on TikTok, um, which I'm guessing is connected to why you think ultimately they need Bitcoin? Yeah, so I think there's a couple of points I kind of want to touch on there. Um, the first being Gen Z definitely does have a maybe perception that we maybe don't want to work or waste away time on social media. Um, but at least all of, you know, most of my friends and, you know, my extended Bitcoin community friends all over the world, I think we want nothing more but to work. And most people my age, you know, you look at their calendar and there's not a second that's free. You know, they kind of, most Gen Z I know wants to do everything, feel like they have to do everything. Um, but I do think there's, you know, a couple um, different instances that harm our ability to do everything. Um, one being social media, definitely how short attention spans are becoming, I think is a problem. Our ability to really, 
think long term, stick through a hard problem, be curious. Um, and there's a couple of things I heard recently. One, this was from Jimmy Song, but how obsessed we are with the utility of our curiosity. I think Gen Z isn't really rewarded right now for just being curious, thinking. Um, and then Safe posted this yesterday on Twitter that this is the like Gen Z is possibly the first generation that doesn't have to earn their money twice. And so because our money, our you know energy over time doesn't hold its value, kind of just dissipates, we can't just think and be curious. We are so focused on, you know, how do we just support ourselves to live our life? Um, so I think there's a lot of societal implications that are, are coming at Gen Z and we're just trying to do our best to keep up, um, but it's hard. Are more Gen Zers adopting Bitcoin? I, I'd love to know with just your peer group, are you seeing a lot of people who already get it or do you feel like there's a lot of work to be done? No, no, I think there's a lot of work to be done. Um, and I think definitely in the in the West and especially in the US, um, for instance, in Africa, other parts of the world, not the case. Um, but my peer group, um, so for instance, I'm in the Cornell Blockchain Club and there are 60 of us and I am the only Bitcoiner. Um, on the whole campus, I really thought I was the only Bitcoiner. However, I found one MBA student and then a couple, um, I think re three researchers in the engineering school. They just published a paper about the benefits of Bitcoin mining. So I'm not the only one anymore. Um, but I think sort of something I, I touched on earlier, most people my age, they, they understand Bitcoin as a monetary asset but they are not in they feel like maybe they don't have a place to contribute they think the innovation will happen somewhere else i think that's why crypto can be really attractive is that oh i can you know if i'm a cs major i can i understand smart contracts i can i can build i can do all of that um and i also think another large part is that most gen z we don't have our nest egg yet you know we're not really thinking about that we can think about investing um, most people my age think you have to own the entire bitcoin they don't know they could own you know a penny's worth mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of visible and kind of invisible pain points but you know to answer your question in one sentence i, I think most gen z is not gravitating towards bitcoin they're kind of hearing about it and they're thinking oh this is the first one there's got to be something better it's kind of like, no, no, this is the first one that worked. There's so, there's decades of history in Bitcoin. Um, and so I, I really want to bring, encourage Gen Z to take another look. You know, they don't, they don't have to adopt it, but they have to know it's out there for them in a more honest perspective than they would see from mainstream media or news. It's time for a quick break to hear these messages from my partners who make this podcast possible. First up, Bitcoin 2024, the world's biggest Bitcoin conference, is coming to Nashville next year. Come join us for three full days of keynotes, panels, networking events, workshops, concerts, and more. My first ever Bitcoin conference was back in 2021, and that's where I dropped my first episodes of Coin Stories not expecting this to become my full-time job. Anything can happen here, especially if you dream of working in the industry. Ticket prices go up every month until the big event, so don't miss out. You want to get your tickets early. Head to b.tc slash conference and use the code HODL, H-O-D-L, for 10% off. I'll see you in Nashville. Next up, CoinKite, which offers everything you need to safely self-custody your Bitcoin. CoinKite produces the Cold Card Wallet, which is the cold storage device I use for safekeeping my Bitcoin. You can verify the source code it's ultra secure, and it's easy to use even if you're a beginner. Head to their site in my show notes to find all their custody products, cold cards in different colors, seed phrase plates, tap signers, block clocks, and more. And get a 5% discount using my link. Become your own bank with Bitcoin and CoinKite. Next up, CrowdHealth. Health insurance costs are sky high today, and you send your money every month to a massive corporation, and you never see that money again, even if you don't get sick. Luckily, there's another option, and it's all about community. CrowdHealth brings together Bitcoiners who crowdfund each other's healthcare, so you no longer have to pay fiat health insurance companies. You get to help other Bitcoiners, and they help you in return. So how it works is when someone needs a doctor or hospital visit, CrowdHealth negotiates down the medical bill lower than what insurance would be, and the community helps you fund the costs. You get to save the money you would have sent to insurance, and hey, why not put it into Bitcoin? I'm so glad I made the switch to be part of this community, and now I spend only about $100 a month on healthcare. For more information and to join, head to joincrowdhealth.com slash Natalie. All right, back to the show. 
So no Bitcoin classes yet at Cornell is what I'm sensing. Uh, yes, no Bitcoin classes. Um, I teach the new member education and we have a blockchain class and I, there's many lectures on Bitcoin um, that I've started, but there's no, there's no Bitcoin class, sadly. So is that the purpose of Generation Bitcoin? Can you talk a little bit about that and what you do as project lead? Yes, I'd be happy to. So Generation Bitcoin, there's really two pillars. Um, one is to help Gen Z learn about Bitcoin. And two, um, really critical, is to support them in working in Bitcoin. Um, and so the ultimate mission, is, I think, is really to create Generation Bitcoin, to create Gen B. Um, so everything we do is either under the role of education or um, careers. And more recently, we've started a new group called the Bitcoin Students Network. Um, actually, just a month ago, we finalized the proposal. And this is trying to go one step further and really be kind of a connector of students and resources globally um, to just further support the realization of Gen B. That's awesome. I, I, it's just incredible. It's really inspiring to hear this because I talk a lot about my generation, millennials being mm -hmm. sort of left behind, but as we've kicked the can down the road, we've placed the tab on future generations, including ones that haven't even been born yet. And it's yeah. just, it feels like it's getting harder and harder and you grow up in college educate. I, I know how expensive it was when I was in school. That was many, many yeah. years ago. I can only imagine how expensive Cornell is now and what it will be, you know, 10 years from now. And it's like, there's there's this overall, first of all, there's a lack of financial literacy. And I don't know if you want to speak to that in your education, yeah. but also there's just general complacency where we don't question. We don't question why the cost of a college tuition has gone up, you know, 200% over the last two years and how, how much houses have gone up. And of course, that's what puts the most pressure on, on young people. And it's affecting their ability or willingness to have children and have families, start families. And that's super sad because all of a sudden you do start to have a situation where um, you grow up and your life isn't better than your parents, your grandparents, which, which it's supposed to be. We're becoming more productive. We're evolving yeah. as a society. And yet our children are, are left holding the bag for all the bad decisions that these policymakers made decades ago. And I just think there's something really sad about that. So to see someone like you who's standing up and saying, no, actually, we're going to be different. We're going to have this technology that empowers us to be both free and to create wealth for ourselves. That gives me a lot of hope, and I know probably a lot of people watching too. Yes. No, I, I think I couldn't say it any better than you. Um, I think there is a large feeling of complacency, but what I've found in Bitcoin is that exactly what you said, no, it's you have agency, you have a voice, you know, go do your proof of work, go live your life on an honest ledger, you know, shape the reality that you want to see. Um, and I, that's just a huge gift that I've been given through finding Bitcoin. Um, and to touch on the financial literacy piece, I'm at kind of a crossroads of, I don't know if it's a right now a good thing or a bad thing that Gen Z has never been taught financial literacy. I think it is a bad thing that we have never had these conversations of, you know, how are you going to support yourself? We, you know, your parents are, or maybe you yourself are taking out huge loans to pay for education, but how are you going to just live the life you wanna live? And so I think it's a huge failure. We've never been taught that, but also I'm wondering, would we have been taught the wrong thing? Or, or maybe we've, we would have been set at a layer that makes it harder to realize the importance of Bitcoin. So I, I'm a little indifferent right now um, on where that is, but yeah. I, you know, I think, I think through Bitcoin students will learn how to take care of themselves. Um, and we'll see this as an issue. Um, and I don't know if you've ever, there's a really great TED Talks, probably 10 years old, about why 30 is not the new 20 and how important um, your 20s are and that it's a decade that is so transformative and it can't just be overlooked. And I think a lot of times when I talk to my friends about Bitcoin, their conversation is, wow, oh, this is really interesting. You know, I can see that you love this, but I just don't have time to think about this. I don't have time to think about my you yeah. know, financial situation. But you no, know, it's really urgent. We do need to talk about this. This is where you can have the greatest impact in the future. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, I, I think this is just a really critical age group to make sure they understand Bitcoin or at least know about it.
For sure. You know, it's yes. funny, Ella. I would love to just go back to school again. I mean, I, yeah. I've thought, you know, can I get some sort of degree in Austrian economics? Because I, yeah. didn't, I didn't know that I would find such passion in this area of study. But when you're yeah. young, you don't know. You're, kind of, you're, you're asked to choose a major and pick a career yeah. path when you haven't really explored and you haven't been taught all the things you should know about things like money. And so it's funny because I would love, I, I wish I could just rewind time or just have the <laughs> opportunity again to learn because I would have so, so much more of an appetite to actually read all the assignments and yeah. and and comment on them and analyze them and unfortunately we i feel like a lot of the information not only is it told through a very specific framework in whatever country you're in um not to say that there's a lot of propaganda in education yeah. but there certainly is some mm -hmm. to an extent there's there's bias in in education depending on where you grew up and where you live I just wish we could do it over later. I wish there was like another era where we just, we go back to school and then for the next 10 years, and then maybe we change careers after that. But, um, <laughs> but no. I want to learn a little bit more about this intersection that you're focusing on now, which I find fascinating, which is technology and morality, ethics, compassion. I, the, I, when I think of AI, that's the one big worry that's out there right? I mean, if yeah, humans are yeah. designing it, is it going to be good or bad or a, a mix of both? Because yeah. humans are inherently, I think, a chaotic mix of, of good and bad qualities. Yeah. So tell me a little bit more about, about your focus and where that's taking you. Absolutely. And I'll preface with this is such a rabbit hole for me. Um, but if I was not working on Bitcoin, what I wrote all of my college applications about was solving the question of how do we code ethics in AI? Um, and I, I got to this question because of when I was learning Mandarin, um, when I was studying abroad in Beijing. And so it was this whole idea of how do we ensure that technology acts with empathy, empathy that humans aren't controlled by some unethical power. Um, that was my whole, okay, this is what I'm gonna do with my career. Um, because I, I don't know if you've heard of the concept of singularity, you probably have because you, you read so, so much. Um, but basically it's the idea that all machine intelligence could kind of overcome that of human intelligence. And if they have no seatbelt, you know, what do we do? They could potentially have so many detrimental impacts on human life. And so, um, <laughs> that was the preface. Um, and over my coursework, I am studying cognitive science. So how do people think about information, make decisions, um, form judgments? And so I took a class on the psychology of language last semester, um, still with my question of, you know, how could we code ethics into algorithms, into computers? And unfortunately, ultimately, I, I think the answer is that that's not possible um, from that course. It was kind of posed at the end. But I and I kind of wrote an article on this, but I think Bitcoin allows us to take um, language one step further than just spoken language can, because so much meaning gets lost in language. Um, so anyways, I think, you know, AI is, is a huge issue and topic. Um, but then I saw also, and I apologize, I'm going to say his name wrong, but Daru um, Bansal from Unchained, um, he had a great talk at Bitcoin Miami this past year, all about AI and how we could regulate AI as Bitcoin is kind of the digital metabolic currency of AI. So I'm sorry, I'm deep down the rabbit hole here. Um, but that's definitely been a, a topic area of studies Love and it. now now i know that i've found bitcoin um you know I, I thought technology would have a huge impact on humanity thought it would be ai um but i really think that this problem that we already we already have unethical powers controlling our actions and kind of you know restricting value debasing value and, and bitcoin is how we can solve that um so i think it's ultimately the same problem that i was a um, I noticed an AI, uh, but I just found that that problem is actually already happening and that Bitcoin is helping us solve that problem. I think these are fascinating topics to explore this idea mm -hmm. of dematerializing property. And I know Michael Saylor, who you mentioned earlier, has yeah. talked about Bitcoin being the singularity and, and also yeah. about how in a world of AI, Bitcoin can serve as a truth network because you can't <laughs> lie when it comes to energy and, and having a form of money yeah. that's backed truly by the laws of thermodynamics and mathematics 
it is, um, it is that truth that we will need in a world proliferated with images and videos and information that we may or may not be able to trust. So is that something that you want to keep exploring? Like wh- how do you think Bitcoin will actually serve as a vehicle for more truth and, and morality in the future? Yes. So I think it's, I think it's not Bitcoin, lowercase b, Bitcoin, the currency that serves as how do we have more truth and value in the future. I think it's Bitcoin, the network, uppercase b. And I, I think it's that through how it um, kind of influence human action and how our, we think, our consciousness, um, and how we prioritize different values. So because, as you just mentioned, Bitcoin is all about um, a truthful ledger, getting the truth across, that whether we you know want it or not has an impact. Once you are in kind of the Bitcoin ecosystem, you understand the values that Bitcoin embodies, you know, whether you want it or not, it does impact how you act as a person. And so I think, you know, like a Trojan horse for good, as we always say, I think it works in that sense. Um, and I also think, you know, very technically speaking, how can Bitcoin help preserve truth in AI and these technologies that are rising? I think it's because um, it will be the Bitcoin, the currency will be used in these technologies um, to kind of regulate their actions and what they're able to do because humans have the AI, uh, have the Bitcoin. AI, artificial intelligences do not have Bitcoin right now. So if they you know, want to actually be able to continue to function and continue to work, they need to kind of grow their metabolic budget of Bitcoin. Um, so they, they won't have anything to sustain themselves on if they don't act in line with our intentions. It's time for another quick break to hear these messages from my partners. Next up, one gold. Are you a gold bug? I know that Bitcoin and gold are sometimes seen as rivals, but retail investors and even billionaires consider them both to be vital hedges against inflation and economic instability. One gold offers instant access to insured and audited precious metals in your choice of secure global vaults. Backed by trusted industry leaders, One Gold enables 24-7 trading with unique features like auto invest and the bullion card. Plus, you can purchase metals with BitPay. Start now through the link in my show notes or download the One Gold mobile app today. Next up, Fold. Fold is the best Bitcoin rewards debit card and shopping app in the world. You can earn Bitcoin on everything you purchase from Amazon to groceries to your Bitcoin conference ticket with Fold's Bitcoin cashback debit card. And you can play to win free Satoshis or even a whole Bitcoin by spinning the rewards wheel. This is a great app to get someone totally new to Bitcoin and way better than earning reward miles and points. Head to foldapp.com slash Natalie and you'll get up to 10,000 sats when you sign up for Spin or Spin Plus and spend at least $20 on the card. I'm excited to share that I'm an advisor for the Orange Pill app. If you haven't downloaded this app yet, you're missing out on connecting with Bitcoiners in your area. The Orange Pill app is focused on building the social layer for Bitcoin and helping create opportunities for in-person connections and community building. You create a profile and you'll see lots of familiar faces. And then you can search for Bitcoiners and Bitcoin events based on your location. I'm geotagged in my home base, St. Louis, and I'm excited that Orange Pill app has allowed me to meet new people in my city. Come join us, use my referral code in the show notes and start connecting today. Do you worry about the forces in power that are incentivized to try to stop all this in the future and how those worlds will sort of collide? Because I love to be positive and it's my mission to to keep the conversations moving in the direction of what could be if we did have a base layer built on an honest ledger that can't be manipulated Mm -hmm. and what kind of human ingenuity and innovation we could possibly create. But the truth is we live in a chaotic world where there are bad people and bad people who have a lot of power and a lot of fiat money uh, (laughs) who want to remain in power and don't necessarily want the Bitcoin vision of the world that we do. So what what do you think will happen in terms of the interplay of those forces? So, you know, like you, I I want to very, and have a very optimistic view. And I, in the short, I'm not worried. I don't think there's anything that can stop Bitcoin. What I will say is that it's all about the time horizon. I think in the end, whenever that is, you know, Bitcoin will succeed. Bitcoin will win. I think it's, I I don't, um, I'm not naive in that this will just be an easy transition, you know, a seamless, peaceful transition to, you know, the Bitcoin standard. I don't think that will be the case. Um, And I think I'm even more certain in this. Um, So I'm very late to the game on reading the sovereign individual, unfortunately, but I'm finally reading it. Um, And 
what I've kind of gathered so far is that there's so much conversation about cyber monies and how once private property rights or property rights leave the realm of government, um, they kind of lose their ability to control individuals and individuals become more sovereign. Um, and one step further, individuals that prioritize their cognitive abilities and thinking will be the ones that you know achieve the most um, ability to be sovereign and find the most success. And so, you know, this book was written in the 90s, you know, a long time ago, and these authors were able to predict the whole idea of cyber monies and what governments will do to stop cyber monies mm -hmm. and kind of keep controlling their power. And exactly what was written is what's playing out. We see, you know, as now today, government trying to regulate Bitcoin. Um, restrict access to privacy, privacy, restrict private property rights. And so all of this is playing out. Um, so maybe oddly, I find comfort in that, okay, what we expected them to do is happening. And, you know, we can keep on our mission, keep educating Bitcoin. Um, and ultimately, we will win out. I don't know when. Um, but I guess I, I'm, ho I'm still optimistic and hopeful about Bitcoin, but I'm not naive in that it will be an easy um, process. Well, I feel the same way and a great book for you to mention. If you haven't read Sovereign Individual, yeah. it's fantastic. And it really does bring up the idea so far ahead of its time about microprocessing, subverting the nation state and what that will yeah. mean as, as sovereign individuals rise to, to more and more power. And maybe we uh, decentralize more and more in terms of how we govern ourselves in different communities and what does that do to countries and borders. Yeah. It's a really, really fascinating topic to dive into. Um, all right. Well, before we start to wrap up, I'd love to hear about your your upcoming trip to Africa. The Bitcoin <laughs> Africa Conference is one that's really high on my list. I hope I get to go uh, next year. I know you're going to be speaking in Ghana. So what can you share about that? <laughs> Yes, yes. Um, leaving soon. I'm so excited to go. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I hosted a panel at Cornell about Stranded, the Bitcoin documentary. And in it, there's a line that says that 80% of the Bitcoin transactions under $1,000 happen in Africa. Um, and so I think in, in the West and the US, Bitcoin's primarily just used as a store of value. But now I feel so much gratitude to be able to go where Bitcoin is actually being used and Bitcoin is actually you know, making an impact and difference. And so I think I'm going to learn a ton. Um, but I am speaking on a panel. Um, it's called Bitcoin Literacy. Um, it's all about Bitcoin education. Um, but the overarching theme of the conference is how do we disrupt financial oppression and achieve freedom with Bitcoin? Um, so it's three days. It's going to wrap up with a very fun kind of Christmas fair, really emphasize the community aspect to Bitcoin, because I think that's huge. And I think it'll just be a great couple days of speakers and different panels and you know, really just being in the heart of where, you know, Bitcoin is working. Um, and I guess also on a personal note, um, Gen Z is the largest kind of population, if I'm correct, in Africa. So I think it'll be great to really, you know, be where Gen Z is using Bitcoin. That's so true. And it makes me think of some of the topics we've been discussing in yeah. our book club. Ella's in a yes. small book club that <laughs> I, I help host um, where we just read Broken Money by Lynn Alden. And we've talked about a lot of the issues that we just discussed in this conversation. And one of the things that I think is so thoughtful that Lynn always brings up is that this is this is a monetary network. It is really the only possible technology that solves the problem of broken broken money, that the, this fiat experiment that clearly has gone awry in so many ways. So out of curiosity, when yes. someone you're in your, maybe your classes comes up to you and says, well, but what about these other tokens and smart contracts? And, and these are so much cheaper and this is so much faster and, and whatever amount of re reasons they use to, yeah. to support an altcoin. What do you, what do you say to them? What's the difference to you that you like to share about why Bitcoin is so special and unique and why it should be evaluated so different differently from all the other tokens out there? Yes. So I think I'm so far down the rabbit hole, I can come off a little biased um, when I have these conversations. So I just go back to the beginning blockchain trilemma. Like, okay, what are we, what are the different goals we're trying to solve? What's a very objective way to evaluate, you know, your token you're talking about against Bitcoin. And I think in my point of view, Bitcoin is the only blockchain that actually works, um, that actually upholds the values that it was set out to do. It is the only decentralized one. It is the most secure. Yes, it's not scalable on base layer, but that's why we have, you know, innovations like the Lightning Network. So I, 
try to just remove the bias, just go very objective, you know, okay, you know, you have this, what is it trying to achieve? Um, but I think more than anything, Bitcoin is solving an actual problem in the world, as you just mentioned. I think many of the others, they're kind of making up their problem and showing it as a solution. And I think also critically, there is no physical tie to the real world. They all, every one of them has kind of disregarded energy. And, you know, Bitcoin, not crypto, Bitcoin, not blockchain, because Bitcoin retains the tie to the physical natural world, retains the tie to energy. It's not just some virtual solution that exists that doesn't actually do anything. Um, so I kind of, you know, make it unique to where they're coming from, what they're looking at. But in the whole, I try to be objective and not lay on too much Bitcoin initially, but kind of bring it out over time. Ella, can you run for office in 2024? I know exactly <laughs> who I would vote for in that case. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, how does Bitcoin impact your daily? I wanted to ask you, um, how does Bitcoin impact your, your daily life? And I, I ask you this yeah. because I went to a conference in Washington, D.C. this past year, and there were a lot of staff members of elected officials who are just starting to learn about Bitcoin. They're, the curiosity and the interest is there. And mm -hmm. one of the things at the end of the day, unfortunately, that someone came up to me and said is that they learned a lot about Bitcoin mining and serving um, underprivileged po populations overseas and all of that, mm -hmm. but they didn't know what to take back to their congressmen that they work for about mm -hmm. how Bitcoin today can help the average person in their constituency. How does Bitcoin yeah. impact my life today? So can mm -hmm. you share your thoughts on that? And how, how does Bitcoin affect you on a day-to-day yeah. -day basis? Yes. And so I think for me, I it's Bitcoin, uppercase B, Bitcoin, the network that is impacting my daily life more. Um, and I think more than anything, it brings a sense of depth to my life. Everything wrapped up in Bitcoin, the concepts, the values, um, I think has now fundamentally fundamentally changed how much I will be able to accomplish or think I'm even capable of doing in my lifetime. Um, and as we've talked about, once you understand Bitcoin, it really gives you the confidence to think for yourself and re-examine what you've taken for granted as truth. Um, and so I think I mentioned this earlier, but but for me, I have found Bitcoin has given me purpose. Um, and, you know, it's my wish for Gen Z that they can use it to find their purpose as well. Um, but I think most recently, the most tangible example that I can give is that um, a couple months ago, I ran a marathon um, and I really wanted to do something hard. And I had been at this for four years um, since I was studying abroad in China and I could never do it. I could never commit to actually doing it. I would you know, get really excited, work on it and then fall off. Um, but I think the concepts of proof of work and this tie to the physical layer really is what allowed me to actually commit to doing something hard. Um, but now when I wake up in the morning, I'm just kind of like, OK, Ella, you know, you need to wake up, live your life on an honest ledger, do your proof of work do hard things, um, and above anything else, be a good human, act with integrity, low time preference, gratitude, empathy, inclusion. And this is all that I've learned or realized because of Bitcoin, um, you know, from the resources out there, from the community of Bitcoiners. Um, so it's kind of, it impacts my daily life in, in every way. Um, so I'm immensely grateful to, you know, have been aware of all these concepts and, and know about it. Ella, I'm a big believer that yeah. parents set a strong example of mm -hmm. how to be, how to conduct yourself, to have morality and to have integrity. And you clearly were raised by some amazing people, one of whom yes. I am so fortunate I know, Lisa. Shout out to Lisa. Yes. yes. Um, because there, there aren't a lot of people who just have the thoughtfulness and the intelligence and the curiosity that you do. And it's just really, again, inspiring to see. If you weren't in working in Bitcoin and in this space, <laughs> what would you be doing? Yeah. Yes. Well, first, I have to say I do have incredible parents, you know, beyond incredible parents. So I'm very grateful for. Um, but if I wasn't in Bitcoin, I would probably, again, be doing something with the AI, um, how do we embed ethics in AI? I'd probably still be taking my Chinese classes. Um, I've fallen off a bit, um, but I think more than anything, I'd just be, you know, how can I use my days to be the best human I can? How can I just wake up and do something that benefits someone else? Um, and then I'd, I'd find how that realizes, but more than anything, I just try to be a good human. Um, now I know try to do my proof of work, but um, something that can serve others. 
Well, I want to be more like you, Ella. Um, yeah, it was fascinating to read what you mentioned about the, the Chinese character writing because I, I must have been, yeah. first of all, so hard to learn. But I think you wrote somewhere that they actually in they code ethical actions into the language. Like, can you break that down a little bit more? Because I would assume that if you're just looking at a character, it doesn't necessarily have a moral code with it, no. but does it? Yeah, no, no. And I'll preface, I landed in Beijing. I knew nothing. I didn't even know hello. So I saw all these characters and I was like, oh my gosh, this just looks like a whole lot of random lines and squiggles. I don't know what this is. Um, but I love patterns and I really, and I had the most incredible host family and teachers. I realized that all Chinese characters are composed of kind of form, meaning, sound, the morphosyntactic, the phonetic elements. Um, and there's about 214, I think, different radicals, they're called, that when you're just first looking at a character, you kind of can get the gist of what topic area it covers. Um, so all that to say, and there's eight stroke orders, all that to say, Mandarin or Chinese is an incredibly well thought out and constructed language. Um, and so I was sitting in class one day. Um, this was probably, I want to say like September, October, maybe. Um, and we took classes every day. So I, my knowledge had gone a little bit exponentially increasing. Um, but our teacher writes a character on the board. Um, she wrote the character for Xiaoxuan. And she said, you know, you all probably have no idea what this means. Um, but don't worry, you know, I'm going to break this down for you of how you can understand it. So I like to think of learning Chinese as a little bit, maybe as like unlocking a safe. Like once you can get a little bit, you start to unlock more meaning. Um, so focusing on just the first character, Xiao, and I apologize, my tones, <laughs> Chinese is a very tonal language, which I never quite mastered. Um, but she says, okay, you know, let's just look at this one character. And I, you all have learned the components that make up this character. Um, she says, okay, look, um, you know, on the top, there's the character for Lao, which means old. And she says, you know, okay, on the bottom, there's this character, Zi, which means child. Um, and she was like, okay, you know, I, I told you that this character was the character for filial piety, um, which is one of the main tenets of Confucianism. And she said, okay, so what are you visually seeing in this character? And we're like, okay, well, it kind of looks like, like the child is supporting the, the old. And she was like, exactly. Like filial piety is about when you are young, your parents will care for you. And when you are old, you will support the elderly, the, your parents, the older. And so this character is literally in an image showing how you should act, um, that you should support your parents. And so anyways, Chinese is just full of that. Um, the character for good, it's a combination. So that's of, the you know, character for yeah. what word? What? Um, yeah. So it's Xiaoxuan, which means filial piety. Yeah. And so just learning Chinese, I discovered so many different characters had this. There's just so much structure. And so at the same time, I was kind of learning about AI and the singularity. And I was like, hmm, you know, a spoken language, you can code ethics or how one should act. Can you do the same in a computer language? And I think, unfortunately, I've discovered that's not quite possible. Um, but learning, learning Mandarin was just an incredible kind of brain exercise and I'm, I'm going to go back to it um, someday because I love learning the language, but it's an incredibly purposeful um, and meaningful language. That is fascinating. I, I wish yeah. I had studied Mandarin and I, I, that would be a great superpower is just to understand every <laughs> language, right? Um, I know. I wish. And Bitcoin I wish. is its own language, so I love it. All right. Yes. Before we wrap up, Ella, any final thoughts you want to leave the audience with? No, I think it's just, you know, Gen Z, if you've heard about Bitcoin and you've discounted it, you know, give it a second look. Feel free to reach out to Generation Bitcoin, the Bitcoin Students Network. Um, that's all launching and you can find it on my Twitter. Um, but, you know, Bitcoin is for everyone. I think Gen Z don't discount that you don't have anything to add to Bitcoin. You do. You have a place in Bitcoin. Um, and so, yes, I just, you know, really invite them to participate in the ecosystem and, and get involved because it's for them. I love it. Ella, it's been such a pleasure, such an honor. I'm excited for your trip to Africa. Keep us posted oh, and hope to have you back on the show sometime. Thank you. I'd love to. Thank you so much, Natalie. This show is also brought to you by iTrust Capital. iTrust lets you invest in Bitcoin for your retirement with the tax benefits of an IRA. You can defer taxes on gains using a crypto IRA 
or with a Roth IRA, you can withdraw tax-free at retirement. And here are some important things to know. iTrust does not lend against client assets. And iTrust accounts are FDIC insured up to 250,000 US dollars. So if you're doing retirement planning and considering adding Bitcoin to your portfolio, you can sign up for an account and get a $100 bonus at itrust.capital slash Natalie Brunel. Thank you so much for checking out the video version of my show. Remember, this podcast is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Nothing constitutes as official investment advice, and you should always do your own research. Please reach out if you have guest suggestions or any feedback. My email is natalie at talkingbitcoin.com, and I'll see you next time.